Before this properly begins, I want to very explicitly state there's even less aspirations to sound objective in this video, because this season is far too important to my childhood. Every scene, every plot beat, baby me remembers all of it and cherishes every second. Okay, I'm not that overly sentimental. The Zod season of Smallville, unlike the others in contrast, is like a really smooth 15 hour long movie. I say 15 hours because it's 22 episodes, 40 minutes each, where things are very cleanly set up at the beginning, paid off in the middle, and then consequences are dealt with in the rest. It's a political chess game about serious people doing serious things, while in the background, the love story between Clark and Lois is finally fully realized. Also, I'm apparently the only person who likes it because the ratings dropped this season. Something, something, something changing your mind. Lovely, you want me to be. Tell me, what do you Jimmy Olsen became worm food because Clark chose not to kill Sam Witwer, even though Oliver and Tess kept telling him to. What about the option of getting rid of the serial killer before he has a chance to beast out? So as his way of making meaning from all this, he became more utilitarian, leaving his humanity behind and dressed like a Matrix cosplayer, as you do when you're 30. Then trains with Jor-El after seven years of procrastination, but in typical Smallville fashion, after all this build-up, the contents of those lessons happen off screen. I've done everything you asked, why are you questioning me now? Although we do learn that Jor-El taught Clark how to do it with normie humans. Then what would happen in the beds with the non-powered people if- Okay, stop. My training with Jor-El has helped me to manage my powers better. Let's just say that I'm in control of everything. Presumably Jor-El had a robot and everything. Anyways, during this time of isolation, something pulls him back. Lois returns after she accidentally travelled into the future after fighting Tess during the finale. It's actually kind of hysterical how they took a moment of such dramatic and serious intensity and then play it off like, yeah, we fought, but you can't fire me, by the way. Subsequently, the emotional shape of the season is kind of flipped from the previous. Instead of starting with a sense of emotional optimism and becoming more darker, season 9 starts cold and distant then gradually becomes warmer as characters redeclare their love for each other as they act on their last feelings of innocence and recover from their mistakes. Oliver Queen straight up killed Lex Luthor, thus making him not only hairless but lifeless too. But that compromised Snowball to the point where he got in the way of Clark's plan to save Davis thus also contributing to the death of Jimmy in terms of the situation. So after having a manly one tear at the funeral, he must now embark on a journey of self-discovery, where he has to change, where he has to be able to see himself as something more than just a murderer. How'd you know the pressure plate wasn't real? I didn't. Where being the hero is no longer a game, because that's the key aspect that underlines everything about him. Ollie was like an overgrown child, hiding his affections and avoiding reality until that led to the biggest mistake in his entire life. I wouldn't have killed him. I survived for two years on an island by myself, Clark. When it wasn't pouring rain, it was blistering sun. Can I tell you how old I was when my parents died? Five. I never really knew them very well. Everything about my life, it's theirs. You of all people know what it's like to wear a mask, right? The Queen name, Green Arrow, and I just realized there's nothing underneath them. And there's something behind those masks. You're just afraid to face it. You're not running away from who you are, you're running away from who you think you're becoming. You don't have to face it alone. There's a dark place inside everyone, Oliver. What we do with it depends not on who our teachers are, but what we do with the lessons learned. Just because you've given up on Oliver Queen doesn't mean I have. There's three parts to this process of change. First, Clark is there for him after being the one to push him aside. You're not one of us anymore. After the death of Jimmy, they've both grown and are ready to be there for each other. Well, with all due respect, Clark, I'm not sure I'm worth your concern. Secondly, Chloe concocts this Saturday morning cartoon situation where he's gotta save someone who just scammed him. So he realizes, oh, I'm still a hero deep down inside. I don't care what you did. 
Well, who you are, I'm gonna get you the hell out of here. All right, I'm not gonna let you die. And finally, he takes up a protege. So as he learns to look after someone else, he can learn to look after himself. And what if I can't outrun these dark places inside me? That's why you need me. Keep you in check. Oliver's story here is about being able to align one's self-image with one's ideal self again, thus raising the self-esteem to be able to be happy again. And this happiness then initiates his path into getting together with Chloe, where they both balance each other together. She's been doing nothing but work as a means of mourning. Clark, when you disappeared from my life, I retracted into Watchtower. While Ollie learns to live more responsibly. So of course, he'd be in love with the most responsible person he knows. Anyways, speaking of love, by the way, Ollie has two of the best lines ever. I was looking for Tess when the whole building went Resident Evil. You tell me. They came here for our training session, me and not an audition for Kill Bill 3. It's like the most post Joss Whedon era of TV writing, but it's said with such earnestness. I just, I, I can't, it's just, it's, it's, it's. Lois and Clark finally gets together for reals, and it's so satisfying bro, cause the feelings on both sides feel so real and fully realised. Clark's rejection of humanity has only made him hungrier for human connection, but everyone has either let him down or left him. Everyone, except for Lois, who didn't leave but instead disappeared. And when I went away last fall, I... Lois, I felt so lost. And when I came back to the bullpen, you were there waiting for me. I just knew that you were the one that I've always needed. And I needed you to know that. The show makes this a key story point in fact, where in the future, the Earth loses to Zod because Clark chose to fight alone. Because there wasn't a Lois to keep him in tune with his humanity. You abandoned us, big guy, plain and simple. I thought I could stop Zod myself. I tried to take him on as my enemy and I was wrong. While for Lois, she finds a higher calling with the blur, a responsibility which gives her a greater sense of purpose. Like I was... saving the world. <laughs> that strength then lends her the ability to not be afraid of engaging in a relationship with the one person she knows she definitely can't mess it up with. Because if she lost Clark too, the only person that's been there for her, from jest to partners to now love, She'll have no one left. They're both all in. Thus, there's a real feeling of them being truly committed to each other now. It's not just flirting or denying how they feel. There's stars in their eyes. They know how important they are to each other. Oh. Relax, Smallville. Although unfortunately, once they get together, their personalities totally change. Like Lois is more like Lana, a sweet little pea, while Clark is more serious and... Actually, nah, they're still the same. They both still tease each other. Shouldn't you be riding a mechanical bull somewhere? It is Friday night. The only difference is that Clark is more relaxed, while Lois regularly stares at her hunky farmer boyfriend, who, when she turns around, isn't just still there, but is probably tidying the bed. The only thing that's in their way is a bit of fear and some very big secrets. I'm so Zod and the Kandorians is where the show's sense of cohesive 15 hour long moviness comes in, because instead of giving the season's antagonist loads of busy work which either goes nowhere, or make them part of a mystery which retcons to previous seasons, they made the Kandorians just hang around in the background, while Zod is really really horny all the time. So while all his plans go to crap, he somehow looks like Krypton is about to explode in his pants. These new characters are all clones from an experiment jor was forced to conduct under the orders of the Kryptonian Council and a pretty awesome flip scene. Jor-El, he's the truest hero I have ever known. So cool. Zod saw Jor-El as a hero and a brother because they're both rebels who defy the council and believe in more noble values. However, before Zod had his blood taken for the clone, he was denied his wish to have his son cloned. So I have left of my son. Be careful, Zod. They will see you. Thus, the younger Zod clone we see this season is that moment of anger festering for a whole other life. You are as dead to me as my son. Where nothing else matters. Where he learned you don't get rewarded even when you stand with the right people. So all that matters is yourself. 
Zod doesn't see himself as a patriot anymore, he's just a father without a son. And that powerlessness has cursed him with an endless narcissistic hunger. We will be gods on this planet and Kandor will rise again. Callum Blue's performance, you either you like it or you don't. For me, he is the definitive Zod, because A, I mean, it's nostalgic speaking. There were parts of Smallville that I look back on and I could have done a whole lot better. And I think what happened was, is that the writing was so kind of Shakespearean and so big and so uh, emotional that I got caught in a trap of kind of going with the writing. So, what happened was, is that sometimes I was a bit over the top. Kneel before Zod. And uh, looking back on it, it kind of grates a little bit, you know? But B, he's also just so creepy and theatrical in his narcissism. He loves himself. He loves having power over people. He loves pretending to be a noble leader of his people while using that appearance to attain more power. Because when he says kneel before Zod, every human, including the woman you love, will kneel before Zod. It's less about demanding people and either respecting the chain of command or respecting his status, but it's more like a fetish. He gets off from it because when people do, Zod gets to feed that angry man who was just denied what he wanted all those lifetimes ago. On one hand, I like to think Zod looks like Clark as he would his own child. In fact, he mentions he definitely didn't kill jor clone because as someone who lost his own son, he would never deprive a child of their father. I lost a son. And I would never deprive anyone of his father in this life. And initially, he tried to align himself individually with Clark. If we don't deliver their power soon, then sooner or later they will do whatever it takes. But on the other hand, there's also a heated rivalry with him. Because Clark is actually the man Zod pretends to be when it comes to being a leader who cares about the future of his people. Because Clark doesn't see them as a means to an end. He sees them as refugees, needing a home. Thus, half of the Kandorians ends up being loyal to Clark, including Zod's own second-in-command, Fiora, who's pregnant with Zod's child. Someone Zod kills. This moment truly is when Zod's narcissism completely displaces any nobility he once had. In the finale, in fact, Zod would rather stay on Earth to rule it than leave with his people when Clark finds a way for everyone to leave for their own planet and was ready to leave with them. You knew the blue kryptonite would prevent you from ascending like the others. Better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. Obviously, this doesn't happen because Clark gets shanked and falls in a Jesus pose, but the point is, as Zod loses his ability to lead, Clark develops his. There's a quote from Ollie in the previous season where he accuses Clark as being someone who doesn't trust people. You may be invincible, but you are not fearless, are you? You're afraid to trust your friends. You're afraid to face who you were really meant to be. You're afraid of everything. Maybe you haven't been put to the test yet. Maybe your island's still out there, Clark. This season is about dealing with this exact thing. Now, after realizing how much he needs to be a part of humanity, seeing how his friends can rise from the darkest hole there is, how he can't just fight Zod and the Kandorians, but have to work with them, have to lead them, he becomes a charismatic visionary of two groups. One, he leads to a new home. The other, he fosters into a generation of heroes. The honor was ours, Kalo. We see the sort of leadership ability he'll one day use as Superman and see the people around him become better for it. That's really what this season is all about within the big picture storytelling of Clark Kent's biography. But then there's also this other plot that happens in the background. For some reason, they also felt the need to bring in Waller and Checkmate, who wants to draft all the superheroes for a war against the Kandorians, which doesn't really go anywhere because Zod just kills everyone in the end. And any future reference to them is cancelled out by the Red Queen, who basically fulfills the same role as a secret third party. But unlike Checkmate, it's actually good because dun 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 dun, the Red Queen is... Martha Kent. On one hand, Martha being a Waller level mastermind is incredibly goofy because this is Martha Kent. But on the other hand, it's kind of awesome because it's Martha Kent. Like bro, if Jesse Eisenberg tried to kidnap her, he'd be shot in the face by his own security guards. Anyways, bizarrely enough, I'd argue the most important transitionary point from season 9 to 10 isn't actually the finale. In fact, it gets brushed off pretty quickly. Instead, it comes from the midpoint. 
of season 9. The special absolute justice. A TV budget Watchmen style murder mystery with the JSA. Time to go hunting. I remember thinking this was the coolest thing ever as a kid. Now as an adult, yeah. The special is extremely experimental in the way it contextualizes Smallville into a wider universe, where before Clark's generation, there was another. One which was silenced when they wouldn't step into the light, when the government tried to pull them. A moment I particularly love is when Clark walks through the JSA mansion, seeing all this lost history. There's a wonderful feeling of simpler forgotten times, lived by people who deserved better, but were left behind. Hawkman then approaches him with his terrible Batman voice. This generation will make the same mistakes the last one did, like the one before that. He was his generation's leader, but eventually became too jaded, made too many mistakes. Hawkman began crossing the line so many times that the line disappeared altogether. But as we saw from this season, Clark is someone who specializes from rising above those feelings. All the characters review themselves individually. You don't want anyone to know how important they are to you, so you act like a jackass. In order to see how they can serve a greater community, we get a glimpse of what this age of heroes kind of looks like for a second. And it's kind of magical. Absolute Justice, more so than the rest of the show, is a straight up goofy superhero show. Not a drama about people living in a small town or investigating in the big city, but the power of just simply seeing costumes, big characters, crazy powers, melodramatic foreshadowing of a wider comic book world. This is great for a two part special, but then season 10 would take this heavy reliance on intertextual references and launch the show into an insane world. We're stranded. So this video was planned for next month, but I've been babysitting my uncle with dementia, which meant I've just been binging the entire season this last week. So as I finished watching it, I just immediately converted my notes into this video. Anyways, right now what's competing my attention is a Arrow video on season 1 and also season 10. By the way, I've also not really talked about Test Master throughout any of these retrospectives, and that's because I've completely repurposed my Mercy Graves video that I've mentioned ages ago and made that into also a test mercy specific dedicated character study anyways special thanks to everyone on patreon you guys rule Little jellies. Why what, green punching bag?